In my previous videos on ChatGPT, I've delved into its ability to write melodies, harmony, and considered how much of a step up GPT-4 was from GPT-3. One of the reasons I make these videos is just out of sheer curiosity. Setting aside the thorny topics of defining intelligence or the societal implications of these tools, I'm just struck by what a novel interface this is to the written work of humanity. For example, we've been able to search the collective works of Shakespeare or Snoop Dogg for a while now, but to have a hybrid shake dog ask for directions to the bathroom? That's new. The other reason I make these videos, though, is actually out of an appreciation for human cognition and creativity. Part of the reason I point out the flaws and limitations of these tools is to highlight what is amazing about us, our ability to synthesize the information coming from our senses, contextualize our experiences, reason abstractly, and shift and adapt our mental framework. Music is actually a really interesting testing ground for cognition, because it incorporates so much of what makes us human, activating nearly every part of the brain. Anyway, as a composer, I've always approached computers and tools more generally, with an eye to complementarity. How can I incorporate different kinds of notation software, audio editors, plugins, and programming languages into my workflow so that they best serve my creative goals? So the more I thought about it, the more I started to wonder, could I collaborate with ChatGPT to write a piece of music that I'm proud of? that lived up to my own creative standards? And what would I learn about its creative potential in this process? So I set about to work together with ChatGPT to write an original piece for solo violin that was to be a true collaboration between me and it. Is the performance you're currently watching by violinist Camden Boyle that piece? Did ChatGPT really help me to write it? Well, the answer is complicated. And even if it weren't, I wouldn't be a good YouTuber if I just told you. Besides, it's going to be a magical journey involving pitch spirals and evolving rhythmic patterns. Just sit back and enjoy the ride. First of all, two quick disclaimers. First, I'm not exactly a normal composer. Although I often write for acoustic instruments, I usually do so through some sort of algorithmic process which I code in Python. That said, I think idiosyncrasy is kind of the norm for composers, and we can still draw some larger lessons about creative collaborations with these so-called AI tools. Second, it's worth noting that when I started this project, the GPT-4 version of ChatGPT had not come out yet, so my interactions were with the GPT-3.5 version. However, I've since run the same prompts by GPT-4, and I'll note the differences as they come up throughout this video. So with that out of the way, if you're ready, let's dive into my insanely convoluted process of composing a real piece of music in collaboration with ChatGPT. I started by asking ChatGPT to collaborate on a short piece for solo violin. I suggested that we work primarily through verbal description and through code, and that we aim for this to be a true collaboration throughout. My hope was that working with code and verbal descriptions would play to ChatGPT's strengths, while it was never designed to generate melodies and harmonies, ChatGPT was definitely designed for prose and code. Having set the ground rules, I then asked ChatGPT to consider the overall structure of the piece and come up with four different possible forms, using a mixture of musical and descriptive vocabulary. By the way, real composers definitely work this way sometimes. For example, here's a verbal sketch Ligeti wrote for one of his 10 pieces for wind quartet. Anyway, here's how ChatGPT responded. Interestingly, all four options follow roughly the same pattern. The piece begins with blank. It then builds towards a climax in which the violin plays a series of blank. The piece then ends with a return to the original blank, but this time with a sense of blank. Surely these aren't the only forms for a piece of music, right? Well, when I later asked GPT-4 the same question, it responded with a more varied list of options, so this was definitely one of the cases in which GPT-4 did a bit better. Anyway, back to chat GPT-3, I ended up going with option 1. The piece begins with a melancholic and contemplative solo violin melody, played in a high register. The melody gradually builds in intensity, leading to a climax where the violin plays a series of fast and virtuosic double-stop trills. The piece then subsides back into the original melody, but this time in a low register and with a sense of resolution. This is not a bad plan for a piece of music. I mean, it's definitely a bit of a new music cliché, but if I've learned anything about cliches, it's that it all depends on how you use them. So naturally, I asked for more details. What makes the melody melancholic and contemplative? How could I approach choosing pitches for the melody? How does it build towards a climax? What musical techniques give it a sense of resolution at the end? Any ideas for a creative twist? The answers it gave were pretty lackluster, to be honest. To make it melancholic and contemplative, use a slow tempo with rubato. Try using Phrygian or Locrian mode. 
To build towards a climax, increase the density and complexity of the phrasing. These suggestions are generic, which is exactly what you don't want when you're trying to make an interesting piece of music. Again, GPT-4 was better here, offering more nuanced and specific suggestions, for example using a non-vibrato technique to impart an introspective quality. But back when I was doing this, I didn't have access to GPT-4, so I decided to switch gears and try and find a procedural approach to generating pitches. Based on ChatGPT's description, I imagined the opening melody of the piece starting with some simple melodic phrases that gradually get longer, faster, and more wild as the piece progresses. So I asked ChatGPT for some suggestions about algorithmically generating pitches and melodic contours. Most of the suggestions involved randomness, like building phrases by choosing randomly from a bank of possible intervals. But funnily enough, what caught my eye was one of the oldest and most traditional approaches, using 12-tone rows. Now, if you're not familiar with the concept of 12-tone rows, it's a technique pioneered by composer Arnold Schoenberg in the early 20th century. The idea is to take some permutation of the 12 tones of the chromatic scale, called a tone row, and then construct your piece out of transposed, inverted, retrograde, and retrograde inverted copies of that tone row. What makes this technique useful is that none of the intervals between the notes are affected by these transformations, so the piece ends up having a melodic and harmonic consistency. By the way, when we work with tone rows, traditionally we number the different pitch classes from 0 to 11, with C being 0, C sharp being 1, D being 2, and so on. Anyway, my thought was to use tone rows that contained major and minor triads, so naturally I tried asking ChatGPT to come up with some tone rows like that. The results were quite underwhelming. ChatGPT could indeed make permutations of the numbers 1 through 12, but not only did the triads it identified not exist in these rows, but almost all of them weren't even triads. I tried using note names instead of numbers to see if I could tap into the musical aspect of ChatGPT's training data, but it continued to incorrectly identify triads in the rows, and made the additional mistake of including duplicate pitches like C-sharp and D-flat, so I corrected it again, and this time it failed even worse. By the way, GPT-4 is also pretty bad at writing tone rows, and makes similar errors. At this point, it became clear that ChatGPT was just not up to this task. So I gave up, sat down at the piano, and wrote this tone row. Composing it at the piano was much more enjoyable than trying to coach ChatGPT into doing so, and I felt that the result was nicely balanced and musically interesting. By the way, I think the reason that ChatGPT struggled so much with writing tone rows is that just like counterpoint or orchestration, writing a tone row is a challenge that features both rigid logical constraints and fuzzy aesthetic constraints. In my experience, language models find this particular territory very hard to navigate. So getting ChatGPT to write the tone row was a bust, but perhaps it could help me write some code to manipulate the tone row I had created. After all, supposedly ChatGPT is going to put all programmers out of business. Well, I went ahead and asked for a Python function that would take a tone row and return every transposed, inverted, and retrograde version of that tone row. The result looked good, but when I tried it out, the retrograde version was broken. After staring at the code for a while, I realized that the problem was that the transposition variable i was not being added to the retrograde versions. So I pointed out that problem, and it apologized profusely, and went ahead and made a different version of the same mistake. Again, GPT-4 didn't fare much better here. When I took its code and ran it, the first thing that happened was I got a mysterious generator object not reversible error. And then when I tracked that error down, it still had the same kind of problem with not transposing the retrograde versions. At this point, I had to ask myself, is it taking me longer to track down the bugs than it would have to code the whole thing from scratch? So I decided to take matters into my own hands and code up the row manipulations myself. And I decided the best plan was to write a short function to generate a 12-tone matrix. If you're unfamiliar with the concept, a 12-tone matrix is a way of neatly encapsulating all of the transposed, inverted, retrograde, and inverted retrograde versions of a tone row. The original 12-tone sequence occupies the first row, and down the first column you invert the intervals to create the inverted form. From there you complete each row with an appropriately transposed version of the 12-tone row. Having done this, you can access the transposed rows by reading from left to right, the inverted rows reading from top to bottom, retrograde right to left, and retrograde inversion bottom to top. By the way, I tried asking both GPT-3 and GPT-4 to generate 12-tone matrices, but both their attempts to do so directly and the code they wrote to do so were a total disaster. Anyway, having generated the 12-tone matrices, 
matrix, the next question was how to use it in a creative and interesting way. I first considered doing a kind of random walk, and then ultimately settled on a spiral pattern. How I settled on this idea, I can't say, but I liked the idea because it led to a kind of gradual elaboration of the interval patterns inherent in the tone row. Naturally, I asked ChatGPT for help with coding the spiral process, and in this case it did quite a good job, making only a minor error that caused it to skip its initial position. ChatGPT also wrote a working function to find the nearest pitch of a given pitch class. So there are clearly cases in which ChatGPT's coding abilities work better than others. I'm curious to hear in the comments why you think it failed with tone rows, but succeeded in these cases. At any rate, combining the pitch class spiral with the nearest pitch function, I now had a process for generating the pitches I would be working with. As we listen to the final recording, we can watch this spiral unfold. I loved the result, and I think you can hear the elements of triadic harmony that I baked into the tone row. So now it was time to turn my attention to rhythm. In order to make a sequence of phrases that got longer and more complicated, I needed to come up with a sequence of rhythms for those phrases. And the natural way to represent these rhythms would be as a list of durations. My first thought was to generate a sequence of these rhythms using L systems. L systems are a technique often used in generative visual art for creating complicated fractal patterns, but they're equally applicable to music. The idea is that you start with a vocabulary of symbols, say A and B, and for each symbol you define a mapping for how that symbol will transform as you move from generation to generation. You then start with a seed, for example the letter A, and allow that seed to evolve over several generations with the letters from each generation transforming according to the rules you've defined. What's cool about L systems is that these letters can stand for anything. In visual applications they might be directions for moving a pen, but here we could map them to note durations. And there we go, we now have a series of increasingly long and complex rhythms. So how could ChatGPT help with this? Well, I gave it a set of symbols to stand not just for note lengths, but also for doubling and halving of note values, since I wanted the rhythms to include faster passages as they got more elaborate. My hope was that it could help me brainstorm rules for how these symbols would evolve from generation to generation. Since there's such a large space of possible rules to sift through, an AI tool that could generate rules based on my musical goals, such as having the rhythms get faster and more complicated, or keeping triplets in groups of three, would be incredibly helpful. Unfortunately, ChatGPT is not such a tool. It's not even able to predict the kind of patterns that would result from a given set of rules, let alone imagine the musical ramifications of these patterns. Also, it tended to just give me the same rules over and over again. And by the way, GPT-4 wasn't much better, and was similarly incapable of following through on a set of production rules. So that was a bust, and since the goal was to collaborate with ChatGPT, I decided to ditch L systems altogether and see if ChatGPT could come up with other ideas for generating rhythms. The initial ideas it came up with were a bit vague and focused on randomness, but eventually it proposed using something called iterated function systems. I'd never heard of this approach, so this felt like an opportunity to have ChatGPT steer the ship in a direction I wouldn't otherwise go. Here's how ChatGPT explained the concept. You start with a seed rhythm and a set of transformation functions. You then iterate the following process. Randomly select a transformation, apply that transformation, and then let the result be the basis for the next iteration. In this way, a simple rhythm gradually transforms into more and more intricate rhythms. ChatGPT's explanation was quite helpful, but the transformation functions it suggested were clunky, and never led to the kind of results I was hoping for. As with L systems, ChatGPT didn't have the ability to imagine the way a generative process would play out, and so it wasn't very helpful in sifting through possibilities. Also, I'm not even sure that ChatGPT correctly explained iterated function systems, based on my reading of the Wikipedia page. Nevertheless, since ChatGPT had at least given me the idea, I wrote my own code for an iterated function system class, adding the option of a normalization function to regularize the rhythm after each iteration. I then went through a bunch of increasingly convoluted ideas before ultimately settling on this relatively simple system. It uses a single transformation that mirrors the rhythm, appends the second duration to the end, and then randomly subdivides some of the longer notes. I honestly can't remember exactly how I came up with this, but it definitely involved an iterative process of experimentation and adjustment, one that crucially was driven by my ear and my musical instinct. That's the thing about algorithmic music. Even when it's algorithmic, it's intuitive, because you need intuition to come up with the algorithms. 
By combining these systems for pitch and rhythm, as well as a little code to add more and more trills as we build towards a climax, I finally had a process producing the kind of music that ChatGPT and I had agreed upon. What remained was to shape some of this material so that the trills become double stop trills, and to refine the overall effect with dynamics, articulations, and other nuances of phrasing. So at this point I decided to have my program spit out the music notation, and started shaping it by hand in MuseScore. When I work on algorithmic pieces, I often reach a stage like this, in which the algorithm has created a block of marble, of raw material, that I then chisel into its final form according to my musical intuition. I think it's important not to be too precious about algorithmic purity when making music with code, because it can lead to music that doesn't live and breathe freely. Composer Luciano Berrio says that the privilege of music is not to let itself be formalized, to be locked into a certain procedure. Often when I let go of the formal logic that created the block of marble, I start to see new connections, new aspects of the music that the tunnel vision of the algorithm had kept hidden. The truth is I couldn't think of a good way to involve ChatGPT in this process. I did follow the trajectory it had outlined, though, building towards a climax of virtuosic double-stop trills, and then having the original melody return in the low register. ChatGPT and I had discussed that this return should have a sense of resolution, but also feature a twist of some sort. When pressed for details, it suggested that this could mean a new melody, or a new harmony, or a different mode or tonality, or a sudden rhythmic change, or a dissonant unresolved chord. So decisive. In the end, I found my way by accident. When trying to transpose the melody to the lower register, one of the notes, F, went too low for the violin. When I tried shifting it up to a G, the lowest note of the violin, it changed the harmonic character of the melody, making it feel like the constantly shifting tonality of the piece was settling on C minor. I decided to continue down this path, tweaking the harmony of the next part of the melody in a similar way. Then, after landing on an augmented sixth chord, I decided to close the piece with a series of half-note double stops featuring harmonics, which confirmed the key of C. So in a way, I did use both a different mode or tonality and a change of rhythmic character, just as ChatGPT had suggested. But these choices arose from my experience of listening to the music, rather than being imposed on the music from the outside. However circuitous the path of composing this piece may already seem, I didn't even mention a bunch of the other things I tried. For example, I tried asking it directly to generate number sequences to use for pitch or note durations, asking it to write functions to create different musical gestures, having it generate a string of symbols to represent a musical structure, and even having it write a poem in an invented language that I would then turn into the form of a piece of music. I was getting desperate, because at every turn ChatGPT would happily accommodate the request, but fail to produce anything of creative value. Maybe I missed something, though. I'm curious if you all have any other ideas for how I might have coaxed interesting and creative responses out of it. One final place where ChatGPT's creative bankruptcy was fully on display was in our discussions over the title of the piece. It seems that almost no matter how I framed the question, I got gag-inducing results like the trill of triumph, the lonely climax, euphoria, whirlwind, and harmonic hijinks. By the way, GPT-4 didn't do much better, offering such dazzling options as Tone Matrix Elegy, a synthesis of sound and science. After quite a while of this brainstorming, I ultimately settled on The Dance of Shadows and Light, which is definitely not a good title, but it was the best I was going to get. It did leave me wondering, though, why is writing titles so hard, and what makes ChatGPT so bad at it? On the surface, it feels like the kind of task that it could be good at. GPT-4 especially is good at summarizing long texts and exploring associations between ideas. In fact, my wife and I just had our second child, and it was pretty good at suggesting possible names, given a few suggestions of the kind of names we liked. Anyway, I'm curious if you all have any ideas in the comments about why it came up with such terrible titles. So what did I take away from this whole experience? Well, you may not be surprised to learn that I found ChatGPT to be quite frustrating as a creative partner. ChatGPT is very much a jack-of-all-trades, master of none, and most of the time it would have been more helpful to have reliable, narrowly targeted tools, rather than one tool that can seem to do anything, but often does so superficially, or makes subtle mistakes that take time to track down. That said, when it comes to brainstorming tasks, to situations in which there's no right or wrong answer, I do think ChatGPT, particularly GPT-4, can sometimes be pretty helpful. The associative, interpolative nature of these large language models, and deep learning more generally, makes them powerful tools for intuitively exploring a large space of ideas and possibilities. 
Speaking of interpolation, I think that one way we can think about the generative AI tools we have today is as super high dimensional interpolation machines. An example of a simple interpolation machine might be something like a color gradient, where you define two colors and interpolate to find the colors in between. Similarly, the shake dog example at the beginning of this video is itself a kind of interpolation between GPT-4's Shakespeare training data and its Snoop Dogg training data. In fact, I actually experimented with doing a gradual interpolation, transitioning from 100% Snoop Dogg to 100% Shakespeare in 10% increments. Anyway, what's misleading about the comparison between color gradients and generative AI is that the interpolation happening with these generative AI tools is happening in hundreds, even thousands of dimensions, and I don't think anyone is capable of grasping what that really means. Still, the question remains, is interpolation between existing ideas, even extremely high dimensional interpolation, all that creativity is? Could a generative AI in the 1960s have made the music of Jimi Hendrix by recombining elements of what was around at the time? I tend to think that even if creativity is just an act of recombination, the magic lies in choosing which influences to draw upon and in what ways. And I don't see any evidence that current generative AI models can be agents for these kinds of creative decisions. In the end, I'm more and more convinced that there are just no shortcuts when it comes to true creativity. When I first started making algorithmic music, I would always think that if I could just come up with the perfect algorithm, I could generate 20 minutes or an hour of riveting music instantly. Instead, I would spend weeks and weeks tweaking the algorithm, only to find myself with something that was, if I was lucky, half interesting and half garbage. Ultimately, I found time and time again that the amount of time it takes to write a 10 minute piece, a good 10 minute piece, one that I'm creatively satisfied with, is pretty much invariant to the technique that I use to write it. It just takes time. So do I regret this exercise? Well, not exactly. I'm a firm believer that every tool you use shapes your creative process. And frustrating as ChatGPT was, and it was really f***ing frustrating, I still feel that this is a piece that I would not have written without its input. Clearly generative AI has made possible, and will continue to make possible, new kinds of art. But I don't think that real art, art that does more than knock off existing art, is going to get any easier to make. I'm going to end this video by playing the dance of shadows and light for you from beginning to end. But first, I want to acknowledge Camden Boyle for his amazing performance. I'm so, so grateful to Camden for the effort he put into recording this. He's a fantastic violinist and a very sensitive interpreter of new music, so if you're a composer, definitely hit him up. Also, if you're intrigued by the possibility of using Python code to generate music, consider checking out my course on cadenze.com. It's relatively inexpensive and helps support the work I do. Finally, if you made it this far into the video, you should probably like and subscribe, and maybe even support me on Patreon, where I'm posting all of the Python code from this video. And now, without further ado, here's the Dance of Shadows and Light in its entirety.